Well, praise the Lord, we're here. It's Christmas time, it's Christmas Eve, the season in which we have a yearly opportunity to think about, to remember, and to reflect the truths of Jesus, the eternal Son of God, coming to earth to do a very important work uh, some 2,000 years ago now. A time for us to sing songs, to read scriptures, to have good traditions that point us to Jesus. We have even the picture of a, a manger and nativity scenes about. Uh, it's, it's amazing that in our culture, we can have such engagement with this topic, that people will gladly sing songs. People will gladly um, put lights up and put scenes of a 2,000-year-old Jewish family on their front porch. It's an incredible time of year. I mean, it, clearly, this story of Christmas has made an impact not just among Christians, but even in the world, the people who don't believe in Christ, who don't follow Christ. And I don't think that that's for no reason. It's because people see that this is a good story. This is a better story, that somebody came to bring help. Somebody came to be a rescuer, and it happened in the form of a, a little baby? That's incredible. Really? That this little baby would ultimately come to live a life and to do a work that would bring about the changing of the entire world? That people who were enemies can become friends? People who were against God and cursed by God, going to hell, stuck in their sin, stuck in their pride, could be forgiven, could be humbled, could have overjoyed, a sense of joy and, and wonder. And so we're going to take this time to, to go through this passage and many other passages just to be reminded and to be reflective of this incredible story of Jesus and his incarnation. The word incarnation uh, just means the one who came in flesh. He became flesh. He was not flesh before. This is an important part that we, we confess as Christians, that Jesus, before he was a, a human, was actually and has always been God, the Son, second person of the Trinity. And through God's rescue mission, we see Christ, the Son, coming to do a wonderful work. We're going to have one sentence today be our, our sermon topic, our sermon point. It's going to have three, three sections, but let me just give you what our whole time we're going to be speaking about will be. It's this, based on this scripture, is that God's sovereign initiation, God's sovereign initiation of Christ's humble incarnation brings our incredible redemption. Let me say it again. God's sovereign, kingly initiation. This is God's plan. This is God's will. This is God's working. We weren't reaching out to him. He was reaching down to us. He initiated the plan of salvation. And how did he do it? He did it through sending his son, Jesus Christ, in a humble incarnation by taking on our human nature. And what does that do when Christ takes on our human nature and lives our life and ultimately dies our death? Well, he brings about this incredible redemption that we could not have any other way except through God the Father sending God the Son to bring about a salvation for people who would follow him. So let's go through this passage and see how this is preached very clearly from this section. God's sovereign initiation. Well, in verse 4 of Galatians 4, it says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. That even kind of rhymes, huh? When, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. It's important for us to know that we as humans, we do not live in and by our own power, our own strength, our own plans. Yes, it's true, we think we do, but what we must understand is that all of this is here because of God. I mean, even time itself is here because of God. Space and matter 
and people and plants and planets, any other P word you want to put in there, all are here because God sovereignly initiates our existence and our purpose. And so what does this verse start us off with? When the fullness of time had come, meaning time has a trajectory. History has a purpose. History is not just meaningless, although it may seem like it. It seems like people are just living their lives aimlessly, trying their best, going up, going down, failing, making connections, losing connections, gaining friends, losing friends, having important pleasurable experiences, and then having incredibly despairing experiences. It could seem like a zigzag of a history, but that would not be the case. The case is that history, the one that God has made, the one that God created, has been going on a trajectory from the very beginning. Let me just tell you, God made time, and God is the ruler over time. Let me just go back to the very beginning. In, in Genesis chapter 2, the second chapter of the whole Bible, it ends this, or it begins the, the creation story with God marking out time and showing that he's the king over time. What does it say here in chapter 2 of verse 1? It says, Thus and so the heavens and the earth were finished. God did his work, and he finished them, and and all the hosts of them, all the angels were there. And what does he say? The seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day. He, He marks out this seventh day from all of his work that he had done, he said, in six days I'm going to work, and on the seventh day I'm going to intentionally create this specific period of time and mark it out for a specific purpose. God marks out six days for work. He's sovereign to say six six days you work. And then he's sovereign, meaning he's the king. And by his kingly order, he says six days work, one day rests. And he does that based on his own example. He says, look at what I did, you do as well. So God blessed the seventh day. There's something wonderful and unique and an intentional special blessing, a holiness to this rest that God has set up, the Sabbath rest that God has set up. Why? Because on it, God rested from his work in which he had done in creation. God has the ability to mark out time for what its purposes are. So there's a time when you work. And there's a time when you rest. And what is that rest for, this very first Sabbath rest? It's a rest so that we could be with God. He made the heavens and the earth. He made the fish and the birds. He made all those things that creep on the ground, and he made humans. And he didn't just make them so they can just hang out. He made them for a purpose. And he made man to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth and to subdue it And to rule over the earth, just like God rules over the universe, man was meant to rule over the earth. And he was meant to do that not on his own, but as God's special people. And so what does he do later on in this particular marking out of sacred time? He tells man what he should do in the garden. What did he do in verse 15? The Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Guard this, work this, cultivate it, make it wonderful, make it flourish, God says. God is good and wants good, and he wants us, and he calls us to join in his good work. And the Lord God commanded the man, he didn't suggest to the man, he he commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. Just a quick reminder, God's commands are not bad, (laughs) right? What does God command? He says, you shall surely eat of everything in the garden. Chill out, God. Why do you want me to have all this perfect fruit that's delicious? Why do you want me to have all this wonderful tasting and beautiful vegetables? Because he's good, and he does good, and he gives good, and he commands good. We shouldn't think of God's commands as burdensome. It's only our pride that pushes back against God's commands. But what does he also do? God also is sovereign to to command us to be weary and to warn and to be watchful. Verse 17, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God is not only good to give things, he's also good to warn against other things. Why? Because this tree of 
Knowledge of good and evil represents uh, being able to define or control what is good and evil. And only God has the ability to do that. So he's saying, if you reach out your hand and try to eat of something that doesn't belong to you, it's going to bring about your own death. God rightly gives us all that we need, and he rightly says, don't go certain places you don't belong. And when we follow the Lord, we receive his blessings. We, be- we believe him, we obey him, and we receive his blessings. But when we disregard God's warning and his commands, we get his punishment. Rightfully so. Rightfully so. It's not virtuous to say, well, I don't believe you, God, and I want to do something else. I want to do my own thing. No, God warns us so that we don't get punished, so that we don't get cursed. He wants our good, and that's why he commands us toward it. So God, this sovereign God over time, sanctifies time. And then what happens? We know the story. Adam and Eve, they were in the garden. They were in perfection. They had everything they needed. Our, our parents, we got to claim them. They're ours. You know, like everybody has some weirdness in their family, right? I mean, that's everyone. Well, we all have the same weirdness going all the way back. It's, it's Adam and Eve. They're the ones, our first parents, and they were beautiful and gorgeous and strong and smart and perfect in every way, and yet they were still able to be corrupted and to tarnish us. Not only their own actions, but even, isn't it true, when, when we sin, our sin splashes onto other people. It's impossible for it not to. If you were to break an egg, it's no longer whole. It's, it's gone. It's been shattered. It's It's now spilling everywhere. That's how it works. Well, God said he would punish them, and and he did, but he was gracious to not immediately bring about death when they sinned against God and they did eat of the tree. But what did he do? He promised that there would be a time when the enemy, the serpent who deceived Adam and Eve, he deceived Eve, but really not Adam, but she had him and, and gave him the fruit and he ate. Well, God promised there would be a time where this enemy would not remain an enemy. He would be taken out. There would be a time where this serpent will be cast down. It's a good thing. Verse 14 of chapter 3 says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall, all, you shall eat all the days of your life. See, God does not... God is not out of control when humans sin. God is not saying, oh, I can't help it. I can't do anything. You just went against me. Shucks. No, this is actually God's sovereign plan includes him being very, very patient with our sin. He's very, very patient. He looks to us and he loves us and he commands us to to do good. And when we don't, He has every right to smash us, but he's patient with us, and he promises, if you believe me, if you repent, you will have salvation. You come back to a place where I can be, I will be your king. Serve me rightly, believe me, follow me. But what does he say to the enemies, the people who are against his his people? He says, I will put enmity, I will put strife, I will put warring between you and the woman. There's this this war this between humans and, and, and the serpent, which represents Satan, and between your offspring and her offspring, between humans and Satan. And you shall bruise, and he shall bruise your head, serpent. This human, there's going to be a coming human who's going to crush your head. And yes, in this war, you're going to bruise his heel, but your head is more important than your heel. And so he's going to prevail over you. This is a good promise that he makes. And this, there begins the clock. When it says, in the fullness of time, there became a clock of redemption that started to click. Tick tock, tick tock. When would God bring about the Savior, the one who would crush the head of the serpent? And so we're just going to take a little time here to go through what Hebrews lays out so quickly. The very first children of Adam and Eve after the fall... Cain and Abel, you know of them, chapter 4, 
Was one of them going to be the, the one who crushed the head of the serpent? Well, we see the two brothers, and we see Cain. Cain gave an offering. It wasn't pleasing to God, and Abel was. Was Abel the one who's going to be that God, the one that God promised? Well, he was righteous in God's sight, and God blessed him. Verse 4 of chapter 11 of Hebrews says, By faith, there was belief, there was submission to God. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, his brother, through which he was commended. He was praised as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Well, Abel was a good example of how to believe God, but he wasn't the one to save. And so hundreds of years go by, and the world turns into a terrible place. But there's one shining light that God preserves. It's Noah. Chapter 11, verse 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning the events yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he commanded, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteous that comes by faith. Again, the picture, there is only two types of people, those who love and obey God and follow his commands because they love God, or those who disregard God, who don't follow his commands, who want to do their own thing their own way and become enemies of God. There is no middle way. You're either submissive and humble and lacking of your own pride, killing your own pride and saying, God, whatever you say is right and best, Thank you for giving me all of life. Or you say, even indifferently, even with a small amount of smugness, you could say, ah, oh, it's not a big deal. I'll just do whatever I want. I'll just keep on. It's not a big deal. I'm not dead. I mean, clearly, it's not a, it's not a big threat here. But that's pride. That's, that's, that's going to bring condemnation. But praise the Lord, God saved the world through Noah, in that Noah and his family believed God and built an ark so that they could be saved from the coming destruction. Not only then, hundreds of years later after that, Abraham comes on the scene, and God chooses a man, not only in Noah, but now in Abraham. Would this Abraham be the one to save the world, to defeat Satan? Well, no, God is still working. It wasn't time yet. It wasn't the fullness of time yet. Verse 8 of chapter 11 says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Here's another good example. Not a perfect man, but an obedient man. When he, came, when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in a land of promise as, a, as in a foreign land, living in tents with his sons, Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of that same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. You know, as we look at biblical history, we see that there are people in history who, when told by God the truth and given commands by God, they are able to have faith. They are able. Why? Because God gives them the truth, and he gives them the ability to see the truth. And what do they do? They say, okay, God, you made an amazing promise, so I will believe that and follow you. And we see generations here, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all following the same promise. But was it Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who was going to break the head of the snake? No, it wasn't time yet. 400 plus years follows after that. We go from roughly 2100 BC now into about 1500 BC. Moses comes on the scene, and finally, God is going to establish not just a, a, a person, not just a family, but now a nation. God is doing a work in the fullness of time. He's bringing about a plan, a patient plan, an, imp- an intentional plan. Verse 24 of chapter 11 says, By faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He wasn't identifying with the things of the world and the things that would make him good in the world, like being Pharaoh's daughter. He didn't grab on to worldly prestige. No, he had a a different and better perspective. It's better to follow God than it is to follow man. It's better to be seen as weird and destitute 
and different than it is to be seen as high and mighty and lifted up by other humans. God has the right perspective, and we often have the wrong perspective, and it is when we submit to God's perspective that he blesses us. Verse 25, Moses choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. To be a follower of God is to say, I will trust the Lord and I will intentionally step into mistreatment and pain, not because it's good, but because it shows the difference that I, bl- I trust God even to my own hurt. I'm not faking it. It has a real effect. It costs me something. It costs me comfort. It costs me pain. It costs me separation, ridicule. So verse 27, by faith, Moses, he left Egypt and was not, not being afraid of the anger of the king. He had a higher perspective than the king. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch him. When God gives commands on how to rightly worship him, we don't worship him in another way. He, by faith, says, God, you told me to kill a lamb and to to sprinkle the blood over the door so that I might be saved. I believe you. Instead of asking the question as and accusing God of not making sense, how many of us say, or how many of us have heard, it just doesn't make sense. I don't know how the blood of a of a of an animal or could ever affect me. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. And you could have a question like that, but the whole point is that God is teaching us things through time. He's teaching us through this lamb. Look, that lamb needed to die in order for you to be saved. And there will be one lamb who will need to die in order that you might be saved. It's, it's building a picture. He's, tra- he's putting the training wheels on so that we can understand things level by level by level. God is a good God, a patient God, a sovereign God, and he's initiating a plan that we are to patiently follow and trust and obey. Well, I won't go through the rest of biblical history, but I appreciate the way that the, Hebrew, the writer of the Hebrews sort of sums it up towards the end. He says here, by faith, Uh, the people, he just kind of moves quicker now, the people crossed the Red Sea on the dry land, and, and, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, they drowned. God, God saved his people, but he judged his enemies. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down when they, after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. By what, shall, what more shall we say? For time would fail me to tell of all of these examples of God's patience and purpose throughout time. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, the king, who would ultimately be another covenant holder, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. What more could I say? Story after story after story after story, there's only two people. There's only two types of people. There's the people who believed God's commands and followed God's commands, and God would bless them in spite of much adversity Or there was the people who did their own thing, going their own way, making their own decisions, defining their own terms of what life and success and obedience and righteousness looks like. There's only two ways to live. But when was God going to fulfill his promise? When would the fullness of time come? Hebrews, again, says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But finally... In these last days. Now, 2,000 years ago, these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. God sovereignly initiates our salvation. We are sinners stuck in corruption and condemnation. There's no way for us to get out of our plight. We did not love God. We did not trust God. Our parents didn't. 
we don't. And so we bring on the wrath of God because he warned us ahead of time and we still did it. But God patiently, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, millennia after millennia, was doing a work to bring about one man, the man, Jesus Christ. And so let me just stop here. God's sovereign initiation. This is a good time. Christmas is a time to think about God's sovereign plan. God is not just a God of a baby in a manger as if it has no larger context. He was working the details for thousands of years, patiently bearing with sinful people, giving opportunity and again and again and again. Let me ask, have you learned to love God's sovereign timing? Have you learned to say, Christmas is a time for me to think about time? I only have so much time, but God is working out every moment of time for me. He's giving me a plan. He's giving me a charge. He's giving me something to do with and for him, and it's a good thing. Will I submit to God's sovereign sovereignty over time, over my time, over my life? Or is time something you want to control? Is time something that you want to be about your sovereignty, your control, your expression. Unfortunately, in our day and age, we have a, an idolatry of time. We actually kind of want to get time back, don't we? Because we know it's scarcity. What happens? Uh, plastic surgery, trying to get time back by the way we look, right? All these life hacks and uh, technology, constantly trying to save time, save time, save time. Because we inherently know that we're not controlling time. We're just in it, and it's going with or without us. Click, click, click. A second is still a second because God is keeping it a second. We inherently know that we're not running this universe. Well, praise the Lord that in this universe, God brought about a time in which he would bring about salvation. Let's uh, go on to our middle section here. God's sovereign initiation, he's the one who does all these things, but what is he doing moving towards? It was through Christ's humble incarnation. Going back to Galatians, it says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. God the Father sends God the Son to be born of a woman? How incredibly beneath him is that. God is so much higher. He's so much mightier than we are. He is the creator, not the creature. And yet God became inseparably united to his own creation, a human nature, even to the point where he would be born in the womb of a woman. That is a very painful, very difficult process, a very messy process. God would humble himself to push through the canal of a woman. This is incredible. There's a reason. This is, this is absurd in so many ways. There's reasons why other, other religions like, like Islam thinks this is an abominable thing. They think this could, not, this could never happen. Jesus could never be the Son of God because God would never unite himself to his creation like that. That is so beneath him. And in some ways, they're right. In some ways, it is beneath him. But in other ways, they're wrong because God loved us so much that he would bring to himself our lowly state and experience every part of our life, including birth itself, it shows you how his sovereign will is mixed with his sovereign love, and love will serve humbly. The incarnation, he was born of a woman, born under the law. He wasn't just born to any woman. He wasn't born to a, a queen who was already in the king's palace, who would be the, the prince of all the world. No, he was born of a woman who was poor, a peasant, Somebody who of, of low estate, no name. 
And not only that, born under the law. Born under the law, meaning God is the one who gives the law. God is the one who who commands how people should act and command how people should live. God is the author of the law. If he authors the law, he is above the law, not under the law. He makes the laws. Why would he place himself under the law? Because we're under the law. And he would place himself in a place where we could get salvation. So then we are under the law. Therefore, Christ needed to go to become a human and needed to be under the law. Just go to Luke, Luke chapter 1. There's too too many things to go to in Luke, but just one clear example, born of a woman, born of of Mary, who was a a miraculous conception. She she had never been with her husband, and yet God was going to be the one. This is another example of God's divine sovereign initiation. This is not man's plans. This is God making it happen here. Luke 1, starting verse 30, and the angel, God sent an angel to talk to Mary, and he said, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall, con- shall call his name Jesus. Yahweh saves is what that means. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. Look at this high and mighty language that the, the angel is giving to Mary. He's going to be the son of the Most High. He's he's going to have the throne of your father David. His kingdom will not have any end. And this is the high and mighty nature of of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. But he's telling a peasant woman in the desert at night. This doesn't seem fitting. But in God's divine wisdom, he chose to become of lowest state never, of course, losing his divinity, never losing his godness. No, he took to himself a human nature, something beneath him, and he experienced from the bottom, in fact, he stayed on the bottom most of all of his life. He became a human, and he became under the law. Romans 2 says it clearly that all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. In fact, this is why Jesus is our justification, because he is the only one who actually did the law. He's the only one who perfectly, righteously obeyed all of God's commands. We haven't purposely, righteously obeyed all of God's commands. That's why we need somebody to do that on our behalf. We need a trade. We've been corrupted. Christ humiliated himself, humbled himself, put himself under his own law so that he could help those who were cursed under the law. And Philippians 2 says, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, something to continue to stingily, mightily, or miserly be held on to. No, no, no. God is not a stingy God. He's a, he's a giving God. And so what did he do? He emptied himself, not of his divinity. He emptied himself of this form of merely being uh, God, the Almighty God, no, and what did he do? He, he took on, he took the form of a servant by being born in the likeness of man. He, he united himself to a human nature, body and soul, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God's sovereign initiation of Christ's humble incarnation This is something that God has done at the right time, in the right way, in the right place. Christmas is a time to be reminded of these things and to reflect on how we need these things, not to be stuck in the busyness of life of just going through the motions of what we do, but to stop and say, this is incredible what God did for sinful people. God did this. So do you marvel Does this affect you? Or has it just become ho-hum, not a big deal? No, this is a time to stop and think and reflect. Do you marvel at Christ's condescension? He condescends. He's from on high and he comes down low. And he's 
high and lifted up, and he humbles himself. Literally, his humiliation. He is humiliated by becoming like us. But he loved us so much, he would take on our form and live out our life. So let's look at our last part. God's sovereign initiation of Christ's humble incarnation brings our incredible redemption. It really is incredible. Galatians again. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Instead of being the enemies of God, those outside the camp, those outside of God's family, we now could be adopted as royal sons and daughters. We can now be literally royalty. God is king and high and mighty over all. We could be brought in to the the palace, as it were, because of Christ. When Christ dealt with our sin and dealt with our judgment, we now are free to, to move before God. We are now called sons of God, children of God, daughters of God. And this only happens by faith in God, by faith in Jesus. This does not automatically happen. There are many people alive today who have been alive ever from the beginning who do not love God and do not follow God, and they don't, they don't believe his promises. They, don't, they may want his promises, but without his pathway. His pathway is Christ. He says, if you believe and follow Christ, not playing a game, but truly from the heart, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, actually giving yourself completely to him, he will forgive our sins and make us his family. Verse 5 says, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And he says, because you are sons, because you're children, God has sent the spirit of his son, Christ, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Because Christ had humiliated himself willingly, because God the Father sent him and Christ said, yes, I, I, I will do all that you call me to do in his, in his human nature. He's going to be the, hum, the new human representative for us. Now, the spirit of Christ can be united to our spirit and we can have access to God. We can now be sons of God. We can call him Abba. We can call him Father. We have access to the Father. Just like in the garden when Adam and Eve could freely walk about in the presence of God and not be scared or understand of their lacking clothing, we do not have to be fearful in the presence of God if we are in Christ. We can be fellow brothers, fellow brothers and sisters with Christ. In fact, we even become heirs with Christ. All that Christ did, now we can claim is ours. It's incredible. It's, it's an incredible redemption. Look at uh, chapter 8 of Romans 14. It says, For we were all led by the Spirit of God and are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the same line. And the Spirit himself bears witness. It's an internal spiritual reality. It bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's why when you're a Christian and you love the Lord, you know. You can know that you're saved because the Spirit bears witness with your spirit. And even though you're, you're, not, even though you're not perfect, even though there's still sin and we're waiting for new bodies and we're waiting for Christ to come back, you can have assurance, you can have confidence. God loves me and I love him. He said he'd save me and I believe it. And it's because of Christ and his blood that I can do it. And so I walk in humble obedience because I know that I'm his. We, the children of God, can be heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. Have you just thought about that for a sec? We get to be the fellow heirs side by side with Christ. Incredible. How unfair is that? That's not fair. Christ did all the work. Why do we get all the benefits? Because God is good. Because God is merciful. Because God is gracious. Not because we deserved it, but because he's loving and he's kind and he's He brings blessing, but that's why we should believe him and obey him because we see the beauty of his plan and the simpleness. It's what do you have to do to be saved? Believe in your heart. 
Confess with your mouth. Believe in Jesus Christ and say, he is God, he is man, he is king, he fulfilled all the the righteous requirements that God for us. And if we hand our lives over to him and say, whatever you want, I'm yours, we trade our life. We give him our sin, he gives us his life, his blessing, his honor. Now, we won't get that. Just like Jesus was mistreated and misunderstood on earth, we will be mistreated and misunderstood on earth. That's the feuding that continues to take place with Satan and all of his followers. But let me encourage you. Do you think, when you think of Christmas, do you think that Christmas is a time for us to pray more or to pray more fervently? I would encourage you, that should be a regular thought of Christmas because it's because of the work that happens in Christmas that you have closer access to God in prayer. Do you know that God listens to you because of the events of of Christmas? If it wasn't for Christ doing his work, he would not listen to you. You would be his enemy. You would be against him, and he would be against you. But because of Christ, he now, you can now be brought close, and he will now listen to you and answer you and love you and take care of you as a family member. Look what it says in Hebrews 4. Since we have a great high priest in Christ who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold our confession, our belief statement, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. No, Christ went through all of our weaknesses. He went through our pain and our sleepiness and our our tiredness, our hunger. He went through growing pains. He went through, I don't know, awkward teen years. He went through all of these things. He went through being lied against and being slandered against. He went through being misunderstood by being rejected by his family. He, he went through powerful, authoritative people conniving and conspiring against him. He went through everything, and yet without sin. Look what it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has, tempted, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He is the new and better, truer Adam, the new head of our race. Let us therefore what? Then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace. That means prayer. That means worship. That we may receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. You can have more confidence in your prayers because of Christmas. You can know that God hears you and will answer you and will take care of you because Christ has made the way. He's opened the door, and now we can go through that door, which is Christ. So let me ask you, do you love close access to God through Christ? Are you so grateful that God hears you? Are you so glad that when you pray, that when you say, Lord, please forgive me, I I did it again. I sinned, I sinned. I don't want to sin, but I keep doing it. I believe lies and I was wrong. Lord, please forgive me. Do you love it that he will hear you and forgive you instantly? That you don't have to carry around the guilt or the burden, but you do have to carry around the grace that he gives you, which is not a burden. Remember, this only happens because of Christ, and it only happens in Christ. This is not true if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ. This is only true in Jesus Christ. There's many counterfeit Christs out there. There's many other paths. It says, wide is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. It's only in Christ and Christ alone. And if you're here today and you have not placed your faith in Christ, you've not submitted your life fully and said, I need God's forgiveness. I need Christ's blood. I, I call you to f- repent, to, to humble yourself and say, Lord, help me I have pride in my heart. I'm scared. I don't want to give up what this world has to offer me. I want to keep my sin. I want to keep my pleasures. God says it's a lie, and it's, it's taking you to condemnation. Jesus is the truth, and he takes you to life. And so have faith in him today, this Christmas, and he'll change your life forever. Let's end with this passage in Ephesians, which so beautifully talks of all the things we've we've spoken of this morning, this, this incredible redemption that happens because of Christ 
he, it's, it's, it's all here. God's sovereign initiation of Christ's humble incarnation brings our incredible redemption. Let's see Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father, the one who sent Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, not in anyone else, with every spiritual blessing. You can have every blessing that you, you, you need and want in Christ, in the heavenly places. Why? Why in the heavenly places? Because that's where Christ is now. We're blessed in Christ. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, God, the God of time, of, he chose this plan from long ago and he made sure it came about. That we should be what? Holy and blameless before him. That we should have access to the throne access to our God. In love, what did God do in love? He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his sovereign will and his sovereign timing, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved, Jesus Christ. And in him, in Christ, we have a redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, According to the riches of his grace, he didn't have to do it, but he chose to do it because he loved us, which he lavished on us. This is not some small, simple salvation. This is an incredible, extravagant salvation and redemption. In all wisdom, in all insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, he was not hiding himself. Oh, slander, 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 when people say, God, why don't you show yourself? He has shown himself from the beginning, to be the the creator, the sustainer of all things. He made sure people understood that he is God. He gave them the scriptures. He gave them the worship. He gave them the covenants. He gave them everything. And now he gives the world Christ. And Christ is the one whom the world needs. And so what does he do? He makes known the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. There it is again. Right when God perfectly decided it would be time is when Christ came to do what? To unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. May we take this season of Christmas, this day that we have today on the Lord's Day, and just be reminded again, salvation is in Christ alone. It's completely of God's sovereign initiative. It's not anything we can do in our own strength and our own wisdom. We must submit ourselves. We must acknowledge our sin. And we must, by God's grace, receive the wonderful blessings. Not so that we can praise ourselves or say, hey, I did it and we did a great job, but so that he gets all the praise. May God get the glory today as we praise Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.